Hello everybody and welcome to episode 33. Uh, in this episode we're going to be working on collectibles, uh, items that can drop that we can pick up. Um, so items that can drop when we maybe destroy grass or pots or uh, kill our slime enemy and so on. Alright, and we're going to start off just by creating a coin, alright, which will let us build up money to then later buy things from shop and so on, alright. Um, lots of things we'll be able to reuse it for, but we're going to start off with the coin. Um, but before we get into that, you might remember the last episode I gave you a bit of homework because uh, we created this quest where you can pick up this hat and uh, complete this quest for uh, our little cat friend here. But if you move from one room to another and then you come back, uh, the hat is back on the floor and um, he's not wearing it anymore. But the quest is still complete and he says thanks again and so on. I'm going to move this slime man, he keeps interrupting me. And also while I am moving the slime, I'm also going to move... Um, we'll just um, we'll delete him for now. In fact, we'll put him somewhere over the top in uh, in the o, in o River. We'll pop just sort of over there somewhere so he's not in the way. And we're also going to put um, O Hat in the River Room as well, just so we can see that this stuff works um, across rooms. So, what do we need to do in order to make the status of the the hat and um, the character remain persistent uh, when we return to this room. Well since we are tracking the status of the quest for a global, the solution is actually very straightforward. I'm going to open up um, OQuest NBC and come to the create event and whenever this object gets created I'm just going to perform a very simple check. Well, I'm just going to copy and paste in and we'll look at it in a minute. Uh, we're going to perform this check, okay? So if global quest status, open square bracket, question mark, the hat quest, close square bracket, equals 2. And if you remember from last episode, uh, when it's 2, that means the quest is complete. Sprite index equal as questy hat. Okay, so he'll go to the right sprite, assuming that when he gets created in this create event, um, the quest status is 2. Okay, so if he should be wearing the hat, he'll be wearing the hat. And then pretty much the exact same thing uh, is going to be done in our hat object. So go to the create event, which we're currently is being inherited from P entity, and we're going to right click that event and click uh, inherit event, which will give us a new event, but with the function event inherited in there, so that it will um, do all of the stuff from the um, parent event. Um, but then we can add in some stuff of our own, and I'm going to do pretty much the exact same thing. I'll just paste it in again. Maximize just to see it. Um, if global quest status, the hat quest is 2, instance destroy. So that will just get rid of the hat if when creating it, the quest has already been completed. All right, so let's just take a look at the effect this has actually had on the game. So we've got our quest giver here, gives us the quest, tells us more about it. We come over to this room, the hat is here, we pick up the hat, and you'll remember we set this up before when we first created lifting objects um, so that we can actually carry an object from one room to the other. You'll notice we've got a small bug here as well just because it's another one of those little edge cases we haven't really had time to cover, but like he's now kind of wearing the hat rather than like lifting it. Um, we're not maintaining the status of um, the sprites uh, being, uh, the sprite for the player being the lifted sprite and so on where between rooms. But we can actually carry the object between rooms. All right, that that, that is working. Um, you can see that uh, doesn't create another one here or anything. We're still just carrying it. But you'll notice if we actually uh, just like throw the hat somewhere down here and we come back, um, it'll replace this um, back here. And also say that the hat was in another room further away and we picked it up and we we dropped it and then moved from one room to the next. The hat is essentially going to go back um, technically to where it where it originally spawns. I think that's quite useful behavior. It means that like if you kind of like lose the hat or you leave it somewhere like we're not rather than actually just remembering exactly where it was, which is more complicated as well. Um, just sending it back to where it spawns just means um, the player's always going to kind of know where to go um, in order to get it back. I think it's a bit more intuitive and a bit more easy to um, make sure uh, an important quest item never gets like completely lost. All right. Um, but anyway, if we, we bring this hat item back and we give it to him now, a true hero indeed, and we, we leave the room, you'll notice the hat doesn't spawn anymore because when it runs its create, it gets destroyed. And when we come back into here, he's wearing the hat as well. And like the quest status is still the same. All right. Okay, with that out of the way, uh, congratulations to anyone who managed to solve that in between these episodes. I think it's it fairly straightforward. The clue was that we have this in a global and we can just check that in the create um, event of each object to make sure that um, 
they remain consistent with whatever the current status of the quest is. Okay, so with that out of the way, we can now move on to the actual subject of today's episode, which is collectibles, and we're going to start off with this uh, coin object. So I'm going to right-click somewhere in sprites and go to create sprite from images, and I'm going to bring in S coin strip 4 from my assets. You can make your own coin if you want. I'm going to set it to 10 FPS, and it's the animation is literally just a, a simple spinning coin, okay? Just sort of created by just making uh, making a coin, and then I just sort of make it thinner over time to sort of give the impression of it spinning around, okay? Um, pretty simple animation. I'm going to call it S coin. Again, 10 FPS, and make sure the origin is um, bottom center. Okay, you can do it from there, or you can drag it manually up to you. The next thing we're going to do is make a new object um, that's going to be a child of P entity called P collectible. Because we want to mostly just inherit a lot of the things um, P entity does, um, which is very useful for a lot of our just game world objects, right? Um, so I'm going to go to parent objects. Um, managers, no, not managers, entities, p entity. All right, just inherits all of that code for us. Um, very useful. Um, we're not going to use a lot of the entity loop stuff. We're going to do a lot of that ourselves. But a lot of this draw stuff, like just being able to make something flash and draw a Z and cast a shadow, it's very, very useful to be able to just sort of copy all that behavior straight across to P Collectible so we don't have to write it again. All right. This is kind of like, you know, this this relying on P entity and shared behavior is kind of the foundation of how we're building this game, really. We're trying to make as many things as possible lean on shared behavior um, because that means we just don't have to write or manage as much code, ultimately. Um, the next thing we want to do is I'm going to make another object um, called O coin. That's actually going to be our coin. Uh, set its sprite to be S coin and make it a child of P uh, collectible. Important thing to note here, because I think this is the first time we've done a, a like a multi-layered um, inheritance chain like this. We inherit from P collectible, which in turn inherits from P entity. So currently, O coin, since they're basically the same object now, um, essentially just is a child of P entity. Okay. And you can see it's inheriting all these same things. You can create as many of these as you want in a chain. Um, as I say, there's going to be some shared behavior that all our collectible objects are going to have that's different from other entities, which is why we have a P collectible um, for them to be a child of. But um, still, it, pretty much everything is going to find its root all the way back in P entity because there's some things just like the flash and stuff like that that just every sort of game entity uh, type of object is going to want to have. Next up, I'm going to come all the way back to P entity, and in entity essentials up here, um, at the end, I'm going to write um, entity drop list equals minus one. Let me just zoom that in a little bit so you can see. Um, this is basically going to make it so we can give any, um, oh, I think I give this a capital L there. Um, we can give pretty much any entity in our game a drop list, which will be um, a list of items just as, as an array that we drop when this instance gets destroyed. As you can see, we already do something very similar to this with our fragments, okay? Um, you might be thinking, well, why not just use the fragment system to drop the items or whatever? Doesn't that do the same thing? And yes, that is true. It does do the same thing, but we want to be able to do both. Because you might recall our plants drop little fragments that are just an aesthetic touch, all right? It drops those little grass leaves and stuff, but we also probably want to be able to drop um, objects, um, uh, coins and things like that um, separately that, um, that might be like semi-randomized and so on. So we're always going to want to drop the aesthetic like fragments from the plant, but um, it might, we might want to randomize or, or play with um, the different types of objects that can drop from a... That, that can drop that are actually collectible by the player, okay? Um, so it's basically going to work the exact same way. We're just going to track it with a separate um, variable, okay? So in this destroy event, we are going to write very similarly, if entity uh, drop list does not equal minus one, uh, drop items x, y, and then uh, entity drop list. So as you can see, this is a bit um, th this is worked out 
um, just as the object is destroyed because we just set a variable that says how many of one specific fragment to drop. This is just calling on a list that we will define somewhere else. Um, so in the create event, we'll um, or for a specific collectible, we'll be able to. Um, Oh, so, sorry, for a specific um, entity, we'll be able to define a specific drop list, maybe even randomize it within the create event, and then we just take that array and uh, send that through to drop items when um, the object gets destroyed. And it's very useful to be able to just reuse this code, though, since we are just dropping things in the same way and creating that same sort of um, you know s spiral pattern, and we can use these speed variables and things like that um, that we wrote um, back in this function. It's very handy. Reuse code whenever you can. Don't write the same thing again if you don't have to. So that's um, uh, now just um, a part of p entity, right? So they have a net drop list of minus one by default, and when destroyed, um, if that's not minus one, they'll try and drop whatever whatever is in entity drop list. Okay. So we can go to any of our entities now that can actually be destroyed. I think we've only got that set up with O plant so far. And I'm going to right click on create and go to inherit event. And then um, importantly, after we inherit the event, because as you remember, we set entity drop list to be minus one um, in P entity. So we don't want to set our drop list and then overwrite it with minus one. So we've got to define the drop list after we inherit the event. I'm going to write entity drop list equals, um, and we'll just define a simple array, O coin, O coin, O coin. So we're just going to drop three coins every time a planet is destroyed. Okay. Later on, we'll want to randomize it and we'll just be like, oh, choose between dropping nothing, a coin, and, and so on. But for now, just to make sure it works, we're just going to drop three coins. So we can go ahead and test that now. I'm going to run the game, bring ourselves in, and you can see when I break this planet, it looks like only one coin has spawned, but there are actually three there. It's just we don't actually have anything written into spawning. Uh, an entity or a collectible that will cause them to kind of um, actually use that speed and spread out. If you remember the function that we wrote, um, drop items, creates um, all the objects in one spot, but gives them um, uh, an evenly distributed angle and speed, but we just don't use directional speed to do anything. Um, so that's something we're going to have to write into um, P collectible specifically so that when they get spawned, they, um, they kind of spread out from their position, all right? You'll also have noticed probably, um, you look back a little if you want to check, but the coin had um, a really big shadow underneath it that was kind of oversized for a coin. It's inheriting the shadow behavior from um, the P entity, and we'll make that a bit better later on because they're all kind of just using the same shadow sprite. Um, and later on, we're going to want to make this a bit more dynamic so its size is specific to the type of entity. Um, this was just to keep things simple for now. Um, so, but don't worry too much about that. We can just come to O coin for now, go to variable definitions and literally just turn off entity shadow so that you know, we, we just don't have to worry about that right now. Then I'm going to come, uh, we'll close these things. I'm going to come to P collectible and in the end step uh, where we would normally do all these things like if the game's not paused, set our depth, or, um, all these things to do with being lifted or thrown, we're never going to want to pick up or throw a collectible. And also this stuff um, with falling back to earth and stuff, um, if we're above zero Z, is going to interfere with some other stuff we're going to want to do with our collectible later on. So generally speaking, we're just going to, we're going to override this because we, we don't want to run all of this code. Uh, some of it we'll want to duplicate, but um, most of this we don't want to do. So I'm going to do override event, which will create a new event here. And this event will just happen instead of the parent event okay if you ever want to get it back you can just delete this event and you'll get um your inherited event back again um and then you could go to inherit event or do whatever you want but as i said we're going to do override event and as long as we have an actual event defined in p collectible um p collectible will run this event instead of p entities event all right and the same will go for o coin so you see if we go to o coin end step it's got this blank one now because it's inheriting it from p collectible um with priority over the parent of P collectible, which is P entity. Okay. So the first things we're going to want to do in here are um, these that I'm just going to copy and paste in. Um, we'll maximize this because we're going to be looking at this for a bit anyway. 
Um, a lot of this is just duplicating some of the behaviors we did want from P entity. Okay, that um, we don't necessarily want to override. We just have to pick one or the other. So you know, we can't we can't inherit little bits of it, unfortunately. So um, not with the setup we currently have. Um, so we want to make sure our flash still degrades over time. Um, we've got some friction, which is basically going to work the exact same way it does in our fragments, right? Just reducing our speed over time. And then this x plus uh, length dir x and y plus length dir y, just to move this object in whatever direction and speed we happen to have set, which we know we've set from the drop item function, right? Um, and again, depth equals negative bbox bottom. Those are the things we know we want to happen every frame, all right? Um, in fact, we can just watch that now if I run the game again. We should now actually get our coins to spread out in very much the same way that the fragments do. So they kind of... There we go. There they spread out properly. Now we just need to be able to actually, you know, collect them and pick them up. Okay? Now, we're going to do this code in between, in, in this space that I've left here, okay? Um, this is just to make sure that we do it before, you know, we... we um, commit to moving in a speed in a direction. Uh, what I'm going to do is make it so the, these uh, collectibles magnetize to the player, so they kind of, um, if the player gets close enough, they just start moving towards the player, just to, just as a little um, extra feel touch, just to make it so it's um, easy for the player to collect coins and they don't have to work exactly onto the spot where the coin is or collide with it. The coins will try and sort of help the player collect them, all right? Um, it's kind of a useful thing to have for collectibles in general, I think. So I'm just going to call this magnetize. If instance exists, oh player, always good to check that the player exists before doing anything involving them. Um, var px equals o player dot x var py equals o player dot y and var dist equals point distance x y px py okay so it's going to find where the player currently is assuming they exist um, and it's going to get the distance between this collectible this coin and where the player actually is okay so that's all we've done we just worked out how far we are away if this less than 16, arbitrary magic number, you might, if you want, um, want to define that as a instance variable that you can then change between your different collectibles if you want some of them to magnetize from further away. I think generally we can just keep it consistent. Um, so I'm just using some force magic numbers. Maybe you want to use them as enums or whatever. Or, um, constants or whatever. Do what you want. I think this is a perfectly reasonable case to use just a magic number. I'll leave it. I'll leave that decision to you. Uh, I'm just going to call this magnet radius. Again, like if the main reason to not use a magic number here would be if you want to vary the number between different types of um, collectible. Um, but otherwise, this is like the only place we're going to use this number, so it doesn't matter too much, right? Okay, so if that distance is less than 16, um, spud is going to... Uh, short for speed of course, plus equals 0.25, so we're going to accelerate and we're going to set our direction to be point direction x, y, p, x, p, y. p, x and p, y obviously standing for player x and player y, right? So we're just going to point ourselves towards the player and steadily increase our speed, uh, meaning we're moving towards the player. And then we're going to do spid equals min, spid or three, min as you might remember, just returns the lowest of the, the values we put into it. So whichever is smaller, SPID or 3, that just essentially gives us a cap. So it will never move faster than 3 pixels a frame towards the player. All right, set that to whatever you think is appropriate. And frick is going to equal 0. Okay, we're going to not have any friction while we're magnetizing towards the player, just to make things simpler. Then if this uh, is less than 5, so, I mean, we already know it's less than 16, but is it less than 5? This is our collect radius, all right? So if we ever get to less than 5 pixels away, we're not going to do any fancy collision checks or anything like that. We've done point distance. That's enough. We're just going to check if that's less than 5. We're probably overlapping the player. And um, if we're not, we're, we're more than close enough to justify picking it up. Then I'm going to write if collect script arg does not equal minus 1. I'll explain this in a second script execute collect script collect script arg 
Okay, uh, we need to define these variables in um, p collectible. Um, but basically, we're just going to have collect script, which will point at a specific script that will contain a single function um, that will define what should happen for each collectible when it is actually collected. So when we pick up coins, it'll be increasing our coin uh, global variable or whatever, however it is we do that. Um, when we pick up ammo for something, it'll increase that wherever that is and, and so on. Okay, so we can perform a specific task when a specific thing is collected. All right. Um, else, um, it's it's possible as well that like we won't have any arguments. Like it's just a single collectible of a thing that always provides exactly one of a thing. So like our coin will always just provide one coin, right? Um, so it's possible that we won't have any arguments to pass. Like if we pick up a bomb, maybe it's a pack of bombs and they contain five, so we need to pass through an argument. But it's possible we won't have any arguments because it's just one of a thing. So we do script execute, um, just collect script, all right? Um, or in fact, actually what we want to do is if collect script does not equal minus one, then script execute collect script without any arguments on the end, okay? Um, that'll just make sure that we can actually collect a thing even if it doesn't have a script associated with it yet, just because it is a collectible, um, which is going to be useful for us because we're not um, I don't have time in this video to <laughs> actually just start doing the collect scripts. That's going to come later, okay? So this is going to be useful for us to make sure we can actually test it and see that it is working. Because either way, no matter what um, is going on with the collection scripts, we just want to do instance destroy here and actually get rid of the collectible once it's within that collect radius. So I'll just scroll up so you can just see that whole um, chunk at once there. That's just going to make the kit so whenever we come within 16, it'll increase its speed towards us. If it gets within a small enough amount, we run a script depending on what collectible this is, and then we destroy the instance itself. We do need to actually cr uh, create these variables, otherwise the game will just crash whenever we get to this if statement because it's like, well, I don't know what these two variables are. So it's collect script and collect script arg. So let's go to p collectible variable definitions. Just add at the bottom here collect script and collect script and you'll see it comes up in autocomplete there um, just to help you out and set them both to be minus one by default okay just zooming in there just so you can see exactly what that should look like so now let's run the game chop up our grass and you can see even there just right away we get close enough to these coins they just start sucking into us and we collect them, okay? We're not running any scripts to actually do anything with that yet. Uh, we'll come to that in a later part when we start adding other types of collectibles. Um, but you can see the basic logic there of how that should work. Once we actually get like our UI that actually shows us having any coins and so on like that, then we'll come to actually making it so these uh, work in that way. But hopefully it's clear enough um, for you um, how those collectibles work. Um, the one last thing I forgot to do that's pretty simple um, is if I come to P collectible and go to the create event, um, and do inherit. What I can do here with a P collectible, just like when it gets created initially, is uh, when we inherit the event, um, I can also just override flash by setting it to equal one, which just means we get a little flash just instantly on our collectibles. You can see like they, they flash white just when they're created. Just, just as a little visual flare, just to show them actually like spawning into the world there. Um, just a cheap little thing we can do just by leveraging, again, just code we've already written ages ago in pEntity just to be able to make things flash, and um, just showcasing, again, the power of using a system like this. All right, um, that's everything for this week's episode. Hope you enjoyed that. Source code available in the description as always, and I'll see you guys next time. A huge shout out to the following Patreon supporters. JDoom986, Darth Wolf, Jake Rumsey, Raymond Harvey, Tranquil, Havig, Elizabeth Nalandon Brown, Julian Cropley, Michael Kolich, John Kenai, Stephen Chenier, Borgia MK Ultra, It's Matt Poor, Rachel Stewart, Arctix, Feral Princess, John C, Team D, Jordan Hake, Dalvor, Vacant, Pong Pong Zhao, Jason Welch, Andrew Gilbert, Reva, Kaiser Ho, Boris the Wizard, Figgy, Cabbage Pants, Yoram Pater, Leo, Scott Matthews, Sami and Yai Legaglow, Rene Dam, Rupinda, Dark Rider 0318, Jason, Relentless Rex, Bertie T, Daka Dondigo, Robert Churches, Seanathan, Basil the Dog, and Max M. If you want to support the work I do, a link to my Patreon is in the description.